time. So as we can continue our midweek study here in John chapter 19, uh, we're going to look at a message that I've titled, Where, the, Where True Power Lies. Where True Power Lies. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of vying for power, you know, in, in our world. Uh, certainly we see it uh, politically, uh, you know, right front and center. Uh, but, you know, we don't have to look at politics to see that. We see it within, you know, from, you know, even young ages, you kind of see this people positioning and, and, and what have you. And um, I think it's important to be on the right team, <laughs> right? And we're going to see tonight where that is. And, and it doesn't change, right? It never changes. And I love that about being a follower of Jesus, that uh, we always know which team we're on. We're, we're on God's team. And so, uh, you know, I like a, a saying I heard one time. Uh, it, it said, I'm not so... Uh, interested in, in God being on my side, I want to be on God's side because he's always right. You know, we, we, we might choose the wrong side sometimes, but if we choose God's side, that's always the right side. I think it was Abraham Lincoln that said that, in fact, uh, wants to be on God's side. And I say amen to that. So, of course, here we've, we've uh, studied through the, the Last uh, Supper. We've studied through uh, some teachings of Jesus, really powerful teachings. I go back a couple weeks, and we did a review of that, I think, three weeks ago, if you're interested, if you didn't see it. Um, and then last week, of course, in John 18, the betrayal of Jesus. And now we're, uh, you know, before Pilate, Pontius Pilate. And he's the governor, really the leader of, of this area, right? And appointed there by the king, uh, Caesar. And it's interesting, you would think that the governor would be in control, right, in power. And we'll see that uh, things aren't always as they appear. So uh, verse 1, right, of course, the Jews have, have brought Jesus, and they want to have Jesus crucified uh, for what they think is breaking their law. And um, verse 1 says, So Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Right, And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe, a purple. They're mocking him, really, here. I mean, they're physically harming him, but they're also mocking him. Purple is a, uh, a color of royalty. And so they're, they're mocking Jesus and the crown of thorns on his head, and they, they beat him. And we've already seen, you know, Pilate before, or last week we saw Pilate and already having doubts and knowing that, uh, you know, Jesus is, is an innocent man from a civic and civic law type of standpoint. And that this is really a religious matter. He tries to sort of push it back onto the Jews, but... Uh, they, they won't have that. Verse 3 says, They came up to him, that's to Jesus, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. And Pilate went out and get, uh, again and said to them, that is to the crowd that is gathered there, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Interesting. Right? So you have the soldiers here, right? And these are, are none to be messed with, right? These are our, our Roman soldiers, the, the, the best of the best at the time, no doubt thinking they're in control, right? Thinking they're in power, if you will. They're beating Jesus, mocking Jesus. Pilate comes out now again, and he says, I find no guilt in him. And instead of doing the right thing based upon principle, based upon, frankly, his responsibility as a leader, he begins to yield or continues to yield, yield rather to pressure to the crowd. Never a good idea. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. There, He reiterates it, right? That he, there, there's nothing that Jesus did that is worthy of, of even being tried here, much less being put to death. And the governor, the leader, the one who was responsible or should have been responsible to put an end to this, uh, if he was a principled person, uh, doesn't do it. Right? The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. Right? Made himself. Interesting. Uh, Jesus, remember, for a very long time, he wouldn't accept praise uh, people tried to give it to him, and he sort of remained, you know, out, uh, always among the people preaching 
God's word healing people, raising people from the dead. I wouldn't say that Jesus made himself to be son of God like Pilate uh, tries to sort of diminish his role. Jesus proved himself to be the son of God, and he proved it many times over and over, and many of the leaders believed, right? Many of the people believed and followed him. Jesus proved himself to be the son of God, and yet Pilate doesn't acknowledge that, right? He, we go on, and, and he entered his headquarters and again said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you won't speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? So, so we see that the soldiers who think they have power and they're punching on and beating on Jesus, right? We see Pilate who clearly thinks he has power. He's the governor appointed by the, the king, I mean Caesar, who they worshiped at this time. Uh, the, the Romans did. Certainly Pilate thought he had power. Right? And he says, uh, I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you. Jesus says, verse 11, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered you over to me has the greater sin. Interesting. We have the Roman soldiers thinking they have power. We have Pilate thinking they have power. We have, uh, and we'll see more conversation around this, we also have, as we saw here, the religious leaders, right? And, and, and to some extent, uh, you could consider them sort of, you know, community leaders uh, too, right? They're certainly in, in the Jewish community thinking they have some power. Interesting, but Jesus here now verbally refutes that. He says, you would have no authority to Pilate uh, unless it had been given to you. And that's so important, in my opinion, for leaders to understand and to remember that any authority they have is given to them by God, and they have a responsibility to use it appropriately under uh, the, the, the leadership of the Lord. So important that we have leaders that understand where their authority comes from, we certainly see examples of leadership uh, power being abused across our country. It's really sad. It's very, very costly to the people, which often uh, abuse of power is. And, and here we see a, a few different groups now uh, demonstrating that perhaps they, they think that they have power. Verse 12, right, after Jesus speaks to him, Verse 12 says, from then on, Pilate sought to receive, release him. Interesting. Pilate sought to, what do you mean Pilate sought to release him? He's the governor. He could say, go, he's free. Pilate is leading by polls, if you will. He's leading by pressure. He's trying to please the crowd. Terrible, terrible idea. You know, two years after this, History tells us Pontius Pilate committed suicide. He never got over uh, this, uh, his, his error here. He was uh, yielding to the noisiest people on the block at the moment, right? Uh, he wasn't considering what is right and what is wrong. He wasn't, he wasn't operating by principle. He was leading by poll, a terrible idea, leading by uh, fear, right? Uh, and we'll see that, that, he, that they ramp up the pressure. They know exactly what they're doing. To, to push the right buttons for Pilate to uh, get him to um, do what, exactly what they want. Uh, but the Jews cry out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Now this was really ramping up. See, Pilate was on uh, sort of a short leash from Caesar because there had been some uh, insurrections, some riots that had gotten uh, out, of, out of hand. And so Pilate was, he was concerned about not only about the, the noise of the people in front of him, but he was concerned about what this might mean to uh, his, his role uh, if, if Caesar got wind, if this grew to something else. So they, they tell him everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. That's really what you call putting the screws on, right? I mean, tightening those screws on Caesar 
or excuse me, on, on Pilate now by invoking the name of Caesar and, and the power of Caesar here, threatening Pilate. We're going to take this higher. You're no, you're no friend of Caesar. Here's someone who claims to be a king. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. Interesting, right? He's playing on, on uh, kind of the whole point that they're trying to make, right? He, he claims that he's the king of the king of the Jews, and they're, they're mocking that, right? And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Then they indict themselves. Oh, not before Pilate. They give a, a, a good political answer before Pilate. Um, but they indict themselves in terms of what's really important. In life and they say we have no king but Caesar right as believers and and if you've been uh, if you're part of the Calvary Chapel family uh, I've been listening very long you know I, I believe in being involved in our communities and doing our best as much as we can uh, to make a difference uh, I we encourage people to vote we uh, encourage people to run for office Right, or whatever capacity God might call you to do, be involved. But in all of that, we never forget who our king is. Our king is the Lord Jesus Christ, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The one who, uh, whose kingdom is not of this world, as we studied previously. Right, so as much as we are involved and, and we want to make a difference for the good, for the glory of God, we, we don't forget who our king is. Here, the Jews denied the Lord. They said, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to be crucified. So, clearly, Pilate's not in control. Right? We, we, we see that. He, 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 he thinks he has power because of his title. The soldiers think they have power because of their role and, and, and what is given to them. At least the soldiers understand their authority comes from somewhere else. Right? The, the Jews think they have some authority, and, and they have some authority in their, their realm. But it's interesting to me that the soldiers aren't in control. Uh, the Jewish leaders, they're not in control. They're having to beg a pilot to carry out what they think should be a, a reasonable sentence. And, and clearly, Pilate wants to release him, but he's too afraid to release him. Clearly, Pilate's not in control. So where's the power? I'm glad you asked. Let's read on. See where, where the real power is. What, what, what really matters in life and in leadership? community. They took Jesus and he went out uh, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side. And by the way, that's what Calvary means, right? The place of the skull. It's pretty cool. Where Jesus was crucified, where, where our sin was paid for, where the creator of the world chose to lay down his life, chose to die for your sin and for my sin, demonstrating his love for us, love like no other, so that we could be forgiven, knowing that the greatest need of mankind is the need of forgiveness. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life so that we could have that opportunity. So all we have to do is turn and follow him. And if you're not following Jesus tonight, I encourage you, make that choice. Do what Jesus said. Turn and follow me, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's close. That was true 2,000 years ago, and it's, and it's more true tonight.
kingdom of God is so close. It's really, in a, in a, in a real sense, it's here, right in us, among us. But the coming, you know, of the kingdom of God is closer, uh, in, in, in a physical sense to earth, and that, that regard is closer than it was even then. And so there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on, on either side, Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So Pilate had written, the King of the Jews, up on, on the, above Jesus' head on the cross in all the languages of the time. Uh, and so the, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but rather write this man said I'm the king of the Jews. So they're not wanting to be associated with Jesus. And they're wanting Pilate to change the wording again, as I mentioned earlier, proving again that they're not in control. Interesting. Pilate answered and said, what I have written, I have written. You know, kind of blowing them off. Like, hey, it is what it is. I've written that, and that's the way it's going to stay. And they could do absolutely nothing about it. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier. Also his tunic. Uh, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was done to fulfill Scripture. Love that. Right? God's Word is reliable. God's Word will be fulfilled. God's Word you can count on. And so uh, we, that's something that uh, you, you can take away, right? As they say, you can take that to the bank. Right? That is uh, of the utmost of, of importance. To realize the scripture says here they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots so ser so clearly this is being orchestrated right this is working according to a plan somebody is in control somebody does have the power that's guiding this it's not the soldiers we saw that it's not the Jewish leaders right they're not getting uh, uh, their way, as we just saw Pilate told them no in regards to changing the sign, and they had to submit to Pilate in order to have Jesus crucified. Pilate's not in control. He knows that Jesus is innocent, and he's uh, yielding to pressure. So Pilate's not in control. There's no, another group here that, that we'll see uh, in a minute that's not in control. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, I can't even imagine what that would be like. You know, the, the, the followers of Jesus here, people super close to him, but, but above all, his own mom, standing there while he's dying on the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to him, and I, I mean, just... Think about this for a minute. Put yourself, you know, in, in, in Jesus' position from a human perspective. Beaten, tortured, wrongly accused, wrongly tried, wrongly being executed, hanging from a cross, um, a spike in each of your wrists, a spike in going through both of your feet. Uh, no doubt, having trouble breathing, that's how they uh, most often died, by suffocation. They couldn't hold themselves up. They had to pull themselves up, so each time you pulled yourself up to take a breath, you're pulling on these nails. Put yourself in his mother's situation for a minute. Pain beyond on pain. Put yourself in the position of his other followers there who loved him and cared for him, who, who had this hope that he was going to rise up. I mean, many times they thought that he would lead an insurrection from their perspective, that he would take control here on earth as they misunderstood his kingdom.
Put yourself in the position of all these folks. But when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. No doubt indicating to the disciple whom he who knows is John. In other words, John is now your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And this, this was a way of um, having John care for her, kind of, kind of take her in uh, uh, to, as his responsibility to help her uh, and to, to care for her as a son would, would do. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So he did as Jesus asked. He took uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, in to provide for her and to care for her as, no doubt, Jesus being the oldest son would um, would have done for her uh, had, had he had he lived. So, in addition to the soldiers, the religious leaders, Pilate himself, the governor, we see another group here, and you might call them citizens, disciples, right? Specifically, disciples of Jesus, and no doubt other citizens that are, are there on scene. And it's evident they're not in control either. All, all, all the, the, the folks that you think might be in control, who's in control? Right? It, it's interesting, of all these folks, who would you rather be? Right? You know, we can't be Jesus, right? We're not Jesus, we're not God. So we're obviously... We're not Jesus, but who do you want to be? The soldier? The Roman soldier? You want to be Pilate? The guy who should be in charge from a human perspective? You want to be the, the religious leaders, you know, or community leaders in that respect? I'd rather be among this group that's heartbroken at the foot of the cross. As hard as that would be. Um, because you, you see here, they clearly have the favor of God. In fact, Jesus, specifically in regards to his mom, is, is instructing care for her, right? And um, uh, no doubt, you know, as we just read, he talks to John and he talks to his mom. I would much rather be, of all these uh, folks, I'd much rather be among these here. They're heartbroken. Their uh, hopes are being dashed at the moment, right? But we'll see that things turn out much better for them in the end, right? Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all is now finished, as I mentioned, clearly according to a plan, he said, again, to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch, held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Check this out. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus laid down his life. And of all these groups of people, who is clearly in control? Who clearly has all the power, not the governor, not the people, not the soldiers, not the religious and community leaders. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, nailed to the cross, has all the power. He is clearly in control of this situation. And I want you to know he's in control today. Right? We have nothing to fear. You know, and, and I, I know that there's, there, there's times we, we get troubled, and, and there's stuff that, that's understandable that, that could be troubling. There's, there's troubling things going on. But we don't need to lose hope. We don't need to fear, because Jesus is still firmly in control. Verse 31 says, uh, uh, Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was a high day, 
the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And so, as I mentioned earlier, people uh, uh, from crucifixion would die of actually suffocating, so they would break their legs, so they couldn't help. You know, they would kind of pull and push through the breath, and that would uh, break their legs, so they couldn't raise themselves up and, and breathe, and they would suffocate. Uh, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. But when they saw that they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So, and, and we'll see that this was, well, uh, to fulfill scripture, that, that his bones wouldn't be broken. Um, and again, for, for those who try to, uh, we don't have time tonight to get into all the evidence of the resurrection. Some try to say that Jesus did, didn't die. These were professional executioners. There's no question, right, when they, they know when someone's dead. And, and in fact, further, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water, a, a, a medical uh, evidence of death. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe John, of course, who was there and who right, wrote this book, the Gospel of John. For these, these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And so again, uh, further evidence of the death of Christ. And then we know overwhelming evidence of the resurrection. And so powerful, powerful stuff. Clearly, Jesus is still in control. And not only is he in control, but he's caring for his people. I love that. Right? Of all the groups here, the ones that our first response might think to be, I don't want to be among those. That's, that's the very folks that we would want to be among, the people who are followers of Jesus, right? because Jesus is clearly in control. After these things, verse 38, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, check this out, though, but secretly, he was secretly a disciple. Um, and he was secretly a disciple for fear of the Jews. He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So, I mean, again, just kind of walk through the time frame. He had, uh, you know, no doubt saw what was going on and, 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 you know, and watched it, and, and now realized Jesus is dead. The Sabbath is coming. It's going to be, you know, some time before uh, they can actually uh, bury the body, take it down, if, if they don't do it before sundown. So he petitions Pilate clearly had some influence uh, and was able to, and it wasn't uncommon for them to grant that for, for those asked, but getting that uh, hearing from the king uh, can, can sometimes take some, some time and some doing. Nicodemus also remember him from John chapter 3, who came to Jesus at night, another sort of secret disciple or, you know, uh, somewhat ashamed to be publicly known of Jesus. Now, they're both becoming more bold, right? They're, they both come out in, in a sense of acknowledging their, their care for Jesus. Yeah, they uh, take responsibility for his body. Uh, Nicodemus, who had came by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight, so that they took this would be stuff they would use to, to, to clean the body and prepare the body for burial. So they took the body of Jesus and bound in the linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews now. In the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So who had the power? Where did the real power lie? And where today does the real power lie? It lies in the Lord. I want to encourage you tonight, if to any extent that, that you've gotten your eyes off of that truth, just look back to Jesus. Realize he, he's in control. All the, all the stuff going on around us, right? And it's not a surprise to him. You know, people talk about 2020. Uh, yeah, it, it's been a year, right? Um, people looking forward to January 1st of 2021. You know, not that far away, less than a month. Um, you know, I, I hope a lot of people aren't disappointed because, uh, you know, is something going to change at midnight? All of a sudden, pandemic's gone. All of a sudden, uh, you know, there's not 
unrest, all of a sudden everybody gets along and agrees. Doubt it, honestly, let's just be real, right? So it's important for us to realize you see governors and you see soldiers and you see people and you see Jesus. Don't forget where the power lies, regardless of what's going on. Right? Choose to be like Jesus. We see leaders here who have no principle. Don't be like that. Right? If you're a believer, in some way, you're a leader. Right? You might have an official leadership role. You know, if you're a parent, absolutely you do. Right? If you uh, are a grandparent, absolutely you do. Right? If you're in you know, a leadership role in the community or at work, or uh, you know, absolutely you do. Well, let's say you don't have any of those, quote, formal titles. Christian, people still look to you. You're a leader. We need to not be like Pilate, not be like the religious leaders in this passage who are not people of principle. They are not people of integrity. They are not people of honor. Right? And, and we need, like the Apostle Paul told even young Timothy, right? be an example. Even in your youth, be an example. So whether you're in your youth or like me, beyond your youth years, be an example. Cling to Jesus. He's the one that's absolutely in control. And he's the one we can trust. And if, if you, and if, as I mentioned, find yourself off, Surrender yourself afresh to the Lord and enjoy him. He loves you and he's for you. He, he's got this. The good news is coming, right? This was a, a dark season, a hard season for the disciples, for the mother of Jesus, for the followers, for all of those around. But it wasn't over, was it? So stay tuned. We'll be back here next week, diving in further, and, and, and we'll see being on God's side is the right side.